It's 12.01, so welcome everybody to our Amherst Community Chat on Thursday, November 12th. Today's special guest is our brand new Public Health Director, Emma Dragon. And she's joining myself, Brianna, uh, Communications Manager for the town, and your town manager, Paul Bachelman. So we've got a lot of questions um, that were submitted for Emma today, and hopefully those in the room can feel free to also ask their questions live. Before we do that, I'm gonna give uh, uh, town manager Paul Bachman a chance to give any updates and then we'll let Emma introduce herself. So Great. Take it. So really happy that uh, Emma <laughs> did a little glitch. She had to run to a new location across the street to get be able to log on here one minute before airtime. She's locked, logged in so nice and calm. A <laughs> um, couple things I want to mention. One is at, on Monday at the town council meeting um, the uh, University of Massachusetts made a pretty extensive presentation to the town council. If you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. Um, they talked a lot about what is happening this semester, and what their plans are for next semester. And those things all have direct impacts on, on our community. Uh, the other thing I want to mention was that yes, yesterday was Veterans Day. And it was, a, you know, even though COVID, the um, VFW and the Legion and our Veteran Services Director, um, Steve Connor, brought a few people together, a very limited number of people, but was recorded for on Amherst Media to recognize our veterans. And another new initiative uh, led by Mary Beth Ogilovitz, our Director of Senior Services, was to gather um, a, a fair number of town employees together who we all then went out and took a number of um, veterans and gave little gift bags to them. And so there's a lot of preparation done in advance to put the gift bags together and then to go out on a beautiful, you know, relatively warm day and people were really appreciative of it. Surprised to find someone at their door, first off, um, although we all had the proper PPE on, um, PPE. Um, so it was, a, it was a good day for everybody. So I want to mention those two things. I know we have lots of questions today too. So we might get to Emma. Okay, thank you, Paul. So um, yes, there's questions coming in and questions that were pre-submitted. So before we get to those, I figured we can give Emma a chance to introduce herself, tell us a little bit about her public health background and her um, experience. So Emma, feel free to go ahead and start that. Hello, I'm Emma Dragon. Um, I'm a nurse and I live in Hadley with my family. I have three young children and a spouse, Kyle, who is wonderful, couldn't do anything or none of this would really be able to be possible without the team behind me at home as well as the team here at Amherst to be able to make public health in our regional area successful. I'm a nurse by background. I also have my EMT. Um, I have my bachelor's in nursing and a graduate degree in emergency and disaster management and have been working at Cooley since 2011 when I moved back into the area. I grew up in Hadley. And so I'm very proud of the Pioneer Valley. Uh, I have nursing experience in emergency behavioral health and case management, as well as uh, school nursing I've been on the local board of health for Hadley since 2018, and I'm still currently on that board as of this time, as well as I've had the opportunity of being appointed on a state level regional and advisory council for local and regional boards of health to really promote public health uh, and develop it further. And at, since 2009, I've had a federal position through Health and Human Services responding to numerous disasters and congressional events uh, through the disaster medical assistance teams. And I just really wanna thank the team at Amherst for being confident in my experience, welcoming me in the past seven days, <laughs> day eight here. And um, I'm just really excited about all the hard but good work we're gonna do together. Great, and thank you and welcome, Emma. We're excited to have you too um, on our team. And there's been some, some chatter on social media that people love your last name um, and they haven't even seen you in the dragon costume yet. So that'll be a little teaser, so stay tuned. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the room live and um, just now I think we'll, try to take these ones first because they're less specific and, uh, to COVID um, and public health related questions. So maybe we can take these ones first and then launch into the, the remaining ones. Um, so this question comes in from, um, from Julie. It's not specifically for Emma, but she's wondering if there is an update on the North Village apartments demolition. 
So I know, I don't have a lot of information on it. I do know that the last tenants moved out of North Village a couple of weeks ago. And so they have the area blocked off to, to vehicular traffic. Um, the, my last conversation with the university, which was some time ago now, is that they intend to keep moving forward with that project and get the renovation done as quickly as possible. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and while we're, we're, while we're answering questions from the Q&A function, I'll just remind those who haven't joined us before, if you would like to ask your question live, please raise your hand in Zoom or star nine from a telephone or feel free to use the Q&A function within Zoom. Uh, never, another question here, without getting into political commentary or any thoughts on, um, on what impact Joe's Biden election will have on Amherst. Wow, um, you know, I think that these, it mostly will uh, two, on two levels. One will be the regulatory level. Uh, there were a lot of regulations, especially environmental re regulations were sort of put in abeyance and things that the town has to comply with, things like that. Um, I think that uh, in terms of finances, you know, in terms of COVID money, CARES, what it was called the CARES Act funds, if that gets um, re reopened uh, for after December 31, that will be very important to us. We have had a substantial amount of, of CARES money so far, but that, that program ends on December 30th. And, um, with, and that's what's helped us maintain where we are so far. Um, and also I anticipate that all the sort of um, language about sanctuary community and things like that will, will not be as relevant. And those are all things that we've had to respond to uh, both operationally, but as also policy-wise as community. So I think all those things will um, go by the wayside, honestly. Okay. Great, thank you, Paul. So we did have a fair bit of questions that were pre-submitted. So I'm gonna start looking at some of those, but for those in the room, feel free to again, chime in with your live questions, raise your hand, star nine or use Q&A. So the first question here, um, I imagine is for Emma. Can you clarify whether children can get tested at the Stop the Spread locations? So I think this is a great question and kind of a moving target. Uh, testing sites availability and the uh, populations that they're able to test is kind of a moving target and constantly changing. What I really want to refer people back to is the Massachusetts COVID-19 testing site where they'll tell you all of the current testing availability, where they are, if you can drop in or if you have to make an appointment. And I really want to refer people back to that. The last I knew the stop the spread sites are testing children, but that being said, things always change and I don't want to give any misinformation. And I'm, I'm not sure, Emma, if you have um, an issue with your mic or your volume at all, it's kind of coming a little bit in and out. So just, oh, a, no. just a heads up there. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the, the next question. Um, this this we've had many times in different ways. So I'm just gonna give a little context to the person who sent this in. Um, they saw once in October that the COVID dashboard showed cases among college students um, separated out from town residents. For the purpose of understanding what is happening in town, can we have the data separated? Uh, for example, we've had 77 cases in the last two weeks and it looks like most of those cases are UMass students. Um, so basically, you know, the, the, the gist of what this community member is asking is, are we going to, or are we able to separate out our um, case count that we report and update daily from our dashboard? And then the follow-up would be, if there is discomfort with putting it on the dashboard daily, can we have the data shared as a standard part of the town council meeting um, so that people can track what is happening in town? I'm happy to repeat any of that. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a comprehensive, I hope my mic is better now. I'm, I'm leaning forward. So hopefully um, I look okay. So, and people don't have to look up my nose. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, I think it's a great question. I think it's a comprehensive question. Uh, I think all of us want the most information that we can get. Uh, with that being said, um, this category, this asterisk that was put on that dashboard by DPH several weeks ago has since been removed. And the, the rationale behind that is that the student, there isn't this bubble where the students are really contained. They are part of our community. Um, the students and faculty, 
that they are with us here and we're all in it together. Um, so the state's thought behind it was to remove that identifier. Um, however, hearing your question, this is certainly something that we can try to look into. Um, I, I don't know if I can speak to town council and what would be available there, but certainly on, I know on the department level here, we can take your question and look into it and see if there's anything we can do. Um, but at this point, uh, regardless of if those numbers were separated or not, we should all be performing the same public health measures that we've been promoting since all of this began, that we all need to remain socially distant, wear a mask anytime that you're in public, uh, most in, and limit gatherings and that frequent hand washing that we need to all be doing. Great, thank so, you, Emma. I, let me just jump on that a little bit. So there is a lot of interest in saying how many of the cases in Amherst are, are, are part of the university? And, um, and that's a legitimate question, but I think one of the challenges for that is that if most of the students who are still in the area are living off campus, so it's still that just because they're affiliated with the university doesn't necessarily mean that they're, it means the rest of the community is, you know, not exposed. Everybody, everybody's swimming in the same ocean here. And so separating that out um, wasn't necessarily a, I didn't understand, we didn't understand, I didn't understand that the public health value of that other than targeting students. And that's not really where we want to go on this stuff. And, and I will say we get a lot of questions on the COVID concerns line that equate UMass cases um, from their dashboard, meaning that they necessarily live in Amherst and that's not always the case too. So that's another question we get asked a lot is they see X amount on the UMass dashboard, for example, and, and wonder if, you know, assume that it's all in Amherst, but that's not entirely the case every time. All right, we've got another question in the room. How do we get our public school kids back to in-person learning and when do you anticipate this happening? What role do you foresee yourself taking in this ongoing discussion? And that question's for Emma. So I certainly think this is a very complex question um, and one that's being evaluated, not just in Amherst, but throughout the state and throughout the United States as well. And uh, I know that I've been invited to the school committee meeting this Friday, so I'm very eager for that. And I anticipate being able to give more information at that time and wanna encourage people to look at that meeting as well. Um, I know that I'm excited to and encouraged for everyone to look at the science and to promote everyone doing the best safer option that we have. With that being said, there's just such an enormous um, benefit, mental health benefit, social benefit, developmental benefit with our children being able to be in schools uh, and the social interaction that us as humans crave and, and really need to be able to be sound, balanced and have well-being. So. Um, I think it'll be a good start uh, and certainly a, a flurry of information, uh, at, I'm sure, at that meeting. And I'm just really happy to be here. All right, I got a, a follow up question that came into the QA. And um... I can't hear you, I'm free. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I was getting a call from somebody, so I had to mute that. Um, so this comes in from, from Laura. It's a follow-up question to what we were discussing previously. Wasn't it true that the last time we had elevated UMass cases, we did not see a spread from students to other community members? How can we take this real life data into consideration? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question and certainly something that we have not seemed to observe widespread community transmission among throughout the age span of our population in Amherst. The majority of cases have been prim primarily of college age humans. Um, and I think that's also part of being a young adult um, 
is having their own challenges with being invincible in a way and, and li listening to recommendations for safety. Uh, I don't think they're alone in that. I think even a, everyone's having trouble with that right now, but I just wanna encourage everyone to do the best that they can uh, to stay alert and to stay safe. I think, I think that raises a question. Uh, it's a real good question. I think a lot of members of the community are asking that type of question. And you know, again, Emma's only been here seven days, but I think once that giving more detail to people on the website might be a benefit. Mm -hmm. um, we've had other requests for more detailed information, like a daily count and things like that. And you know, once Emma gets a little bit under, you know, understands what's going on in town a little bit more, I think that's something that we could really develop. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens after school closes um, come Thanksgiving and what happens in the community at that point. So I think what I think what folks are saying is we'd like more detailed information because it helps us understand the, the sort of gravity of the situation in Amherst. We anticipate our numbers are, are going to be going up. You know, you know, you can see the case numbers going up on a daily basis. Uh, but what does that really mean to me if I'm just a, you know, you know, parent at home or with my kids or whatever, so. We'll be looking at that some more, I think. And that question kind of relates to another one that was pre-submitted. Um, so I'll, I'll read this. Can you, can you explain the difference between cases, outbreaks, and uncontrollable outbreaks? Am I correct in understanding that an outbreak is when more than five cases are tr transmitted as a result of one event or spread from one person, and an uncontrolled outbreak is when cases are spreading without proper contact tracing? And just for context, um, they give an example here that the UMass cases in September, that was an outbreak because the cases were transmitted from person to person, but it was not uncontrolled because we had proper contact tracing. Is that correct? So I think that this is a reasonable question and things that people are thinking about, but I want us to really think about the language that we're using and the terms that term, the terms that I'm hearing in this statement aren't necessarily what we would be use, ugh, excuse me, my tongue got tied, using in the public health field for identifying these cases. I think the terms might be cluster or, yeah, or community spread. Um, so I'd, I'd really need to maybe circle back with that person to really hear more in terms of what they're specifically looking for with the terms that I'm associated with to be able to answer better. And I can connect you with that person who submitted that so that you can have that follow-up conversation. Great, thanks. Okay, so next question here. Um, I'm worried about those experiencing homelessness in Amherst. What is the town doing to help them? Well, that has certainly been something that I know that I've been working on daily, um, numerous times a day, working with on that issue. Uh, Craig's door is, is here in Amherst and already operating. I know that I have been regularly communicating with their administration to make sure that it's gonna be a successful, safe shelter season as, as much as we can um, connect Craig's door with state and regional assets that would be able to support them. Um, and I know it, it's definitely a priority for us here. Yeah. So yeah, I can jump in on that too. I mean, uh, a ton of work has been gone, gone into place, especially with Mary Beth Ogilovitz and Dave Zomack who uh, worked with Craig's stores, but just 100% of the credit goes to Craig's stores for pulling together a new shelter site at the Unitarian Universalist Church on North Pleasant Street, plus uh, renting a number of rooms at the University Motor Lodge. And it's been just incredibly successful. I mean, there's still work to be done. There's a lot of, you know, Emma, I know is tracking down management plans and things like that that are required. Um, and it was their first day was there on the day when um, Jen Brown was giving out flu shots on the, at the community breakfast. So a lot of participation by the town, but Again, getting these two new locations, I think if you, it was really important. If you read the Gazette today, you'll recognize that Northampton is struggling with getting a location. It's a, another um, important location for, for um, folks. And um, so we're working with the mayor of Northampton 
or I'm working with the mayor of Northampton and other mayors and administrators in Western Massachusetts to get a, a dedicated site for anybody who's homeless or vulnerable like that to for isolation and quarantine. Right now, the closest location is in Everett. Uh, and yes, they provide a, a transportation, but it's a hundred miles away. And a lot of people don't wanna get tested because they don't wanna be told they have to go to Everett. It makes logical sense. So um, again, we're advocating with the Secretary of Health and Human Services to get a location in Western Mass. In Amherst in particular though, um, tremendous uh, response from the um, faith community and from the nonprofit sector of Craig Stores that just did really, to get these two things, these two shelters up and running by November 1 was just heroic. Great, thank you both. So another question just came in from the room. Do you think it is appropriate to wait for a vaccine before opening schools? I think that there has been numerous mitigation strategies and researchers and experts that have looked into this in terms of school safety. And I really lean to them to be the experts in this case. Um, there are many measures that are in place to make it safer in school. Um, and with that being said, the guidance is that children with in-face learning is the best um, if we're able to do it safely with the appropriate measures. Paul, do you have anything to add on to that? No, I, I think, you know, I think what you said is, you know, we try to follow the science, you know, align ourselves with the state. We know that there's a mental health benefit both for, for both teachers and for students to be in schools. Um, you know, but there is a compl very complicated is because, because you have to also take into consideration the collective bargaining um, situation that the schools are in. Um, it's not just a unilateral decision by one person saying, yes, we're doing this or no, we're not. It's a, it's a group decision that involves a lot of people. Um, I totally get the frustration that many parents feel um, and how challenging it is. And also, as, as you look at the, I, my biggest concern right now is you look at the prospect of a winter um, where it looks like the numbers nationwide are going up, that we're going to be really um, stuck in our homes and, um, and that that's going to be really hard for people. Another question that we got sent in kind of jumps off of that last statement you made, Paul. Um, this person's acknowledging that the cases are rising throughout the country. Is, is that happening here in Amherst? Is, are we on trend with the rest of the country in terms of um, rising case counts? So I, I think that's a really good question. Um, Massachusetts as a whole, it has a much lower percent positivity than other areas of the country, including the Midwest. Um, Arizona, and I mean, I'm sure many here have heard about the unfortunate outbreaks that is happening right now in El Paso, Texas, and the many resources that they're requiring. Massachusetts has implemented countless mitigation strategies, including the, the mandates with mask wearing, the curfew advisory, and the gathering limits to decrease transmission to really encourage us to follow the, the things that we need to do to decrease our exposure to the virus. Um, so Massachusetts as a whole is definitely much lower. Um, and, and even then, so Hampshire County is lower and Amherst as of this morning um, with our data, our weekly data that came in from DPH has only about 0.3% positivity, which is incredibly low. Um, and I just wanna have people continue to do the good work that they're doing. I know this is tireless work um, and we're all in it together and we're gonna come on the other side of it as best we can. Thank you, Emma. I'm just going to take a quick chance to remind those who are attending live with us that we've got five minutes left before we um, start wrapping up. So if you have questions that you want to pop in the Q&A or raise your hand in Zoom, feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, I'll go to the next question that we had here. 
Um, how has how have the first few days on the job been? What's taken most of your attention? Oh my goodness, it has been a flurry of excitement. Um, it's been energizing and it has been almost around the clock. Uh, even yesterday, which was a holiday for the town and many people um, still had work to do, public health never stops. So a big part of what we've been doing is the homeless, is working with Craig's Place, um, also getting to meet everybody on the team here and really see how welcoming and prepared everybody was and um, eager to have me here. Uh, another thing that I know, Brianna, you're here on this meeting that we're really excited about revisiting public health messaging with our community and seeing how we can improve that and meet our population where we're at. Um, I, I think there's gonna be good things to come, but it's just kind of getting onboarding, uh, remembering your logins, right? And uh, seeing what good things have already happened and see where we can improve on stuff. I also wanna just jump in to recognize Jen Brown who had been the acting health director. Um, oh my they, you know, Emma and, and Jen are making a tremendous team. I uh, really appreciate the um, work that Jen has done during the inter interim period here. Absolutely, Paul. Thank you so much for mentioning Jen. She is so extraordinary in terms of her ability to be flexible and available. Um, I can't even fathom the work that she was doing, doing during the interim time managing all of her public health nurse duties in addition to the interim director duties. Uh, she's just really solid and um, we're, I'm, I know I'm really excited to have, be working alongside her in the public health department and uh, yeah. Yeah, and so, so we've had some cases, we, start, we start have a growing number of cases. So her work is, is our primary contact tracer. Mm -hmm. She's really good at, but she's also reached out to school nurses when necessary mm -hmm. and to the um, state for support. And of course, UMass covers a big uh, uh, load of the cases. So there's contact tracing is really crucial because it has to be done really quickly. Once there's an identified case, you try to do that as soon as possible. So she's on the phone constantly trying to contact people and educate those people. So you came in at just the right time because she needed, she had to step aside, put a lot of these things aside to get working on that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I don't see any other new questions in the room. So I do wanna remind people who are on the call or watching this later, if something comes to mind and you'd like to ask your question or share your concern, you can email us at covidconcerns at amherstma.gov. Emma now also uh, receives those emails. So feel free to um, send us any follow-up, clarifying questions to that, um, that address and we will get you some more information. Um, at this point, I'd like to have Emma or Paul share anything that they didn't get asked or something that they want to leave folks with? Um, I know for myself, for public health, that there are some tips for a safe Thanksgiving that I know we're looking forward to publishing, I think, on the town website and maybe the media, social medias that we're associated with. But those are tips for a safe Thanksgiving are available on mass.gov. Um, and they have a nice poster. It, it's basically do wear a mask when not eating or drinking. Um, do keep your distance at six feet apart. Do wash your hands open off it, often. <laughs> Hopefully your hands will be open when you're washing them. And then do improve your ventilation in your home and windows um, to keep you safer if you're gathering with family. Uh, and there are some don'ts in there too, but I really wanna focus on the positive ones, um, but really it's don't share food or drink, um, limit social uh, touching and um, try to not gather with high risk individuals. But I, I know celebrations are part of what keeps us emotionally and spiritually well and resilient. Um, and I just wanna give people those tools to be able to be safer during this time. Yeah, I just, I just want to add on to that, that it, I think we're all struggling with our own families about how we're going to handle Thanksgiving or any other holidays. And um, 
just sort of understanding that this year is just going to be different and it's unfortunate. It's really mentally hard to get there. Um, but it's something we have to buckle down and sort of figure it out because I think family spread, you know, these, the disease in small family groupings is really concerning. That's why you saw the governor step up and put all these additional um, uh, orders out in terms of limiting the number of people in a, in a, in a house at any one time. So it's going to be tough. And you can find that information that Emma referenced on our Amherst um, COVID19.org website, and as well as if you follow us on social media, it's been shared there as well. Okay, well, we are um, about to wrap up. I want to thank everybody who joined us live. Again, feel free to reach back out if we didn't answer your question or you want more um, information. And we will be putting this up on our Amherst Community Chat playlist as well. So thank you, Emma. Welcome. And thank you, thank Paul. Thank you. Yes. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>